morning again. I heard that, I think. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Scripture today is Revelations 2, 2 through 5. <coughs> I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have preserved and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from your place, in its place. So be it. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the time that we can come and freely worship you in this country, Lord. Lord, prick our hearts today to, to understand a little bit more about the amazing love that you have given us through Christ Jesus. Lord, that it is not about us, that it is about you, who you are, and Lord, our love for you, especially in return, the fact that you have loved us so much. We wouldn't understand what love was if it wasn't for you and the, what things that you have done for us through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word so that we may go out into this world and show the love to others so that they may see our good deeds and it may glorify you in all that we do. Thank you for the freedom that we, come, that we have to come and worship you today, Lord, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't gathered, this sermon is going to be a little bit about love today. In fact, I entitled it, I Love You. Three little words, right? We say them all the time. We say them all the time. We say them all the time. But do we show them all the time? How many times are those words empty? We say them quite often. I love you. I love you. But does your love truly, is it truly shown to the one that you're saying it to? Are you in love, as the scripture says from Revelation, the way you first fell in love? That infatuation, that doing and meaning, that person meant everything to you. Your world revolved around them. Is that the way that you feel about God? I mean, His, his love for you is proven. <laughs> he created you. Look at the glory and the beauty of everything around you. And we, if you think about it and sit and look at the stars and the wonders, He's put us just in the right place in this universe to see all of the glories. The wildlife, the complexity of things and everything. What an amazing God. And He has given it to us for us to enjoy. But yet we're a rebellious, stiff-necked people. And what did He do to show His love even more? At just the right time, He sent His Son to die for our sins. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. If you've been reading along with us, and I know a lot of you haven't, we're doing a reading plan through the Bible, and I am preaching from it, so that hopefully I can spur you to read God's Word. So we're reading it together, and then I expound upon it, try to get you excited about it, try to maybe explain some things that you missed, and get you more interested because God's Word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And as you read and as you pray and as you fellowship together and study God's Word, He will show His love more and more and more and more to you. What an amazing, profound love that God Almighty would love such a thing as I. So we've been reading from Psalms 33 to 50 and Acts 16, 22 through 20 through 20 verse 16. So some of this you may remember right off and especially if you've read it it's kind of fresh in your mind. 
We're going to go through Paul's second missionary journey and some of his, and his third missionary journey. And we're going to talk about some of the things that happened. And last week I closed with Paul and Silas being carted off to jail. And that was a good thing because there was going to be a prison ministry. Exciting. What is love anyway, though? Let's start about that first. The Bible defines it. I read something this week that somebody posted about faith, and I thought to myself, you know, if you didn't understand that faith is divine, defined in the Bible, how clearly it is, and that without faith it's impossible to please God, and faith is that confident knowing that even though you can't see these things, you know that God is real, you know that He loves you, you know that Christ died for your sins, you know all of that. You have a hope that no one can take away from you, and therefore that's why you live a life of love. But this post from a, from a TikTok influencer was, faith is basically whatever you want it to be. So what is love? Let's define it. Because the world's going to think love is this funny feeling or love is something that I feel because you're nice to me and everything. Because you make me feel loved. And I want you to think about that while we're defining this love. And I want to ask you how you show your love to one another and especially to our God. Do you show your love? Because we say it quite often. 1 Corinthians 13, you know the chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's not the definition that the world would know. Because we keep records of wrong all the time, don't we, even as Christians? Isn't our love self-seeking? Isn't it much better when you get the love rather than you get mean things done to you? Oh, yeah, we left off with prison ministry, didn't we, last week? Paul and, and Silas were beat to a pulp. Think about it again. Because the crowds were upset because they loved money more than they loved God. Look at the Scriptures. They were upset because a demon girl... A girl possessed by a demon was set free, but that meant their source of income was gone. So they beat Paul and Silas and threw them into jail. Now, we, don't, we can't fathom that again. We think, oh, we got a little beating. No, they beat them till their flesh was exposed. They were beat to the point of close to being dead and put in jail, put in stocks to spend the night until their sentence was, whatever the, was going to come next. What would you be thinking about midnight when the, when the earthquake came? I'd be thinking, am I going to die? Why am I here? What did I do? Why did these people do this to me? Ooh, let's get back at them. I could be kind of like John saying, should we rain down fire from heaven on them, Lord? I, I'm going to be honest. But what were Paul and Silas doing? Singing and praising and praying. Wow. Now, that's somebody that understands the definition of love. Let me read it again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. None. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Is that what you mean when you say, I love you? Is it? How many times is that not exactly what you meant? Do you casually say it? Do you heartfelt say it? Do you say it with the 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul's trying to explain to this church in Corinth, which we read about this week because Paul visited there? Because they were more worried about gifts and other things than they were about loving one another. Because if I want this more than you, oh, John, James says it, that the jealousy is what causes the quarrels among us. Because we want to be loved. We want to be treated this way. I don't want to love you when you treat me like poop. I don't want to love you. I, I, I don't want to do these things. I, I am easily angered. I want to keep records of wrong. I, I want to rain down fire from heaven. Because it's my sinful self that rages a war against me. But God loves me so much that while I was the enemy of Christ, spitting in His face, piercing His side, beating Him to a pulp, He said, I'm doing this for you. 
John was a disciple who had to figure it out. He was one that wanted to rain down thunder, and then he later is known as the apostle or the disciple of love. If you read his works, John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, not so much in Revelation because it's a prophecy, but you see constantly believing, and you see constantly if you believe, you love. You love, you love, you love, you love. Not just say, I love you, but you love so that the way you love, even with your enemies, it heaps coals on their conscience and sears them. How can this person love me when I have treated them this way? That's not what love is. Love is I feel this way because you've done these wonderful things for me and you make me feel love. But yet this person loves me in spite of all the things that I've done to them. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like Paul and Silas as we read on. Here's some words Jesus said. I'll refresh you there. Matthew 5, verse 38 to 48. You have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles with him. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to shine on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Don't even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, complete as your heavenly Father is perfect. In Luke 6, 27 to 37, But to those of you who will listen, I say, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic as well. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them. Expect nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. I'll ask you again, when you say, I love you, do you mean these things? Even to your enemies, to those who persecute you, to those who would have beaten you for no reason except you in the power of Jesus' name, cast out a demon from a woman, and then you said, well, my financial gain is not going to be as good. So you beat them and put them in jail. And about midnight, they're singing songs and praying. I wonder if they were praying for those who beat them then. Again, I would be saying, why did this happen, Lord? And what are you going to do to those people that did? And Paul and Silas was, were praying for them instead. Luke 9, 54 and 55, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, James and John. He rebuked them because they did not understand what love meant. He did not, they did not understand the love that he was going to show them on Calvary. And what greater love could a man have than to lay down his life for his friend? Is that what you mean when you say, I love you? <clears throat> John had to be transformed into the apostle of love. It's not something that comes naturally. It's not something that's easy for us, anything else. It is a constant daily battle, a constant relying on God, giving to yourself, denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after Jesus for the joy set before you. That if maybe, just maybe, even if you're beaten and whipped and put in jail, you can still have the heart to pray for those who persecuted you and for the others that are in jail and for the jailer. Maybe we can get to that point. Are you just speaking words? Or does your life show a life lived like Christ? Oh, Christian, little Christ, like Christ. Are you living like Christ in the world? 
being humble, loving, wanting your companions, Barry said it earlier, an urgency for them to come to know Jesus Christ. For today is one day closer than it was before. Or is your life a lot of words? John would go on to be the apostle that talked about love so much. But he heard the words that night that Jesus was going to lay down his life. And he did not understand them. Je Jesus told him that night in John 13, 34 to 35, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you also must love one another. By this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. In John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In John 15, 12, and 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And as Barry said it again, I'm not picking on you, Barry. We quarrel in our own families because <laughs> we can't get along. Doesn't say, I didn't say you didn't love them. I did not say that at all. But we still quarrel and fight. And there could be deeper roots in that. Who knows? Do we truly love as these scriptures tell us to love? Or do we cherry pick what we want to from scripture? Let me explain to you again by scripture what God's love is for us. Romans 5, 8. But God proves his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Your sins are forgiven and you will spend eternity in heaven instead of an eternity in hell. Well, that's love. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God that we are His children and that we have His inheritance and that He comes to live with us. So John figured it out in time, 1 John three sixteen. By this we know what love is. Jesus laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. He's getting it figured out, isn't He? It takes time. It takes effort to deny ourselves, to die to take up our cross, to do all the things that's unnatural for us. So we have to submit to God's Word daily. We have to fellowship. We have to pray. We have to listen to the Spirit, to walk in step with the Spirit. 1 John 4, 9-11, This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent His Son, His one and only Son in the world, so that we might live through Him. And love consists in this, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 16 to 19. And we have come to know and believe that lo the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God in him. In this way, love has been perfected among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. For in this world we are just like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. John goes on to write in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-5, through 5, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Because everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who then overcomes the world? How does your love life look? How does it stack up against the scriptures that I've told you? Is there anybody you can think of right now that you haven't loved the way that you should love? Well, if you just thought of that, then you need to go do something about it. <coughs> love even your enemies. 2 John, verses 4 through 8. There is no chapter if you don't realize that. It's just one chapter. I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in the truth. Some. Just as the Father has commanded us. And now I urge you, dear lady, not as a new commandment to you, but the one that you have heard from the beginning, echoing the words of Jesus, that we love one another. 
and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the very commandment you have heard from the beginning that you must walk in love. Oh, verse 7 here. Four, prepositional phrase tying together what was just spoken. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. He's not talking about the Samaritans or the Greeks. He's talking about those that profess Christ but deceive themselves by the way that they live because they don't love one another. They cause envy and divisions and gossip and slander and, and keep records of wrongs. Don't love their enemies. Refusing to, refusing to confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Then two words, watch yourselves so that you don't fall into the same trap. The love of money and the love of God, as I told you, resulted to the part that we're at here in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas are beaten. They're thrown into prison. Acts 16, verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered that they be stripped and beaten with rods. And after striking them with many blows, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to guard them securely. On receiving this order, he placed them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Now, if you know the story, if you read it again, you know that the jailer and his family were saved. There was an earthquake. The jailer came out. He went to kill himself because he was going to face the penalty of death since the prisoners escaped. But Paul cried out, Do not harm yourself because we're all here. Whoa! <laughs> all the prisoners are there. They've all been set free. Not Paul and Silas there, but all of them are there. I don't understand all this. You can put all the thought process you want to it. And let's see this. The jailer put them in stocks also. Did he have to do that? Or did he say also, Oh, that Paul and Silas. Oh, how dare they do this. Would that be the guy that I wanted saved out of all this? Maybe the prisoners, maybe we want a prison ministry. But we read about the jailer and his family being saved who threw extra torment on Paul and Silas by, stop, by taking where they were beaten already and putting shackles upon them. He added to the injury and insult that was already there for something that they didn't do except praise God and set a woman free. Hmm. About midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymn to God. Midnight, I, I, I've been beaten, I, I, I'm exhausted, I'm a, a bloody mess. If I can sleep, that's what I'm going to be trying to do. And again, I'm going to be praying, but it's going to be, why, Lord, why? Why did this happen to me? I don't think I'm going to see the opportunity for a prison ministry or especially for the person who put me in these bounded chains now while I'm here. I'm being honest with you, and I hope you can be the same. This is a huge example of Christ, which that's why I gave you the definition of love and everything first. Jesus went silent before his accusers when he was being mocked, the Son of God, God himself said, if you are who you say you are, take yourself down from there. Have a legion of angels come down and save yourself. Well, if he had not defined the definition of love, then he would have taken himself off of the cross, and you would never, ever be able to be saved, because with man it is impossible. Praise God for the love that we know that we have through what Jesus Christ did for us. All the times when he said, I love you to John, that, that he meant every word of it, but he showed it to us. How does your life show I love you to someone? Verse 29 Calling for the lights, the jailer rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Did you read this and contemplate this? What, what happened? There's an earthquake. The prisoners aren't there. I'm amazed, but I see because I've heard the songs, I've heard the prayers, I don't see one bitter root in these two men wanting revenge or anything else I'm just I'm overcome by the Spirit of God saying what must I do to be like you because I want to be like Christ what would have been different if Paul and Silas would have done things differently 
Maybe that day the jailer and his family would not have come to Christ. I don't know. And we don't know how many magistrates came to Christ or anything else. We already talked about Lydia going back to Thyatira and maybe setting up the church there and everything. Because after this, Paul goes back and strengthens her. And he's released from prison right rather than escaping so that the church in Thyatira would grow. Look at all the things that happened because Paul and Silas lived like Christ in the world that they were in in a situation that, again, I'm going to tell you there is no way that I would have lived like Christ. I know myself. And it challenges me to go down to my knees and ask Him each day to show me more His love so that I can understand it and love even my enemies. After midnight, they, they worshiped, they ate till that morning till they were set free. They still didn't go to bed. They were too excited about telling one another about what Jesus Christ had done for us. Acts 17, some believe, profess Jesus as king. Paul and Silas slip out during the night and go to Berea where they preach the news and it's accepted well. They make their way on to Athens where there's a place that, that is like the world today. Hmm, sounds a lot like the United States. I give you those comparisons when it comes to my head. Full of philosophy, have everything in the world. We know the truth, and we know there's many ways, or we, don't, we know that we're worm food afterwards, or whatever we think we know. We think we know I started it out that way with what faith is. It's defined in the Bible clearly. Creation shouts it out. Nature and everything obey God. The winds and the waves obey Jesus Christ, and they still obey God today. Do you obey God by keeping His commandments, especially the one to love one another? Paul gives a sermon on Mars Hill. Let me explain a little bit more there to help you. Mars is a god of war. Oh, we wage a war with principalities and powers waging for your soul. No wonder we don't have a book of the Bible called um, Athens. Because you couldn't give up your pride, your knowledge and everything else and humble yourself and say, Lord, save me because I can't save myself. Some believe that day that Paul wasn't drawn there in vain. We don't, we don't know what happened. We just know that there's, we don't have a letter called <laughs> Athens. Acts chapter 18, Paul goes on to Corinth. He spends a year and a half there, and you've got two letters to Corinth, and if you read and understand, you know there's at least a letter or two that we've lost. He spent a year and a half there, and that church constantly waged war against the world again and the things of the world and themselves especially being the church being like Christ they constantly wage war with that Paul returns to Antioch the second journey ends and before long a third journey comes about we're introduced to Apollos and if you read back to Corinthians and maybe you did that while you're doing this you know there's some struggle with who do we follow Apollos or do we follow Paul and Paul tells us plainly that that we're not to follow anybody but we're supposed to imitate Christ and build upon the the, the firm foundation that is Christ it doesn't matter who builds upon that in Acts chapter 19 Apollos left for Ephesus uh, left Ephesus for Corinth and Paul went to Ephesus Paul encounters people who were disciples of John. Maybe you understood this, maybe you didn't. They were disciples of John. They didn't know who Jesus was. They were baptized in John's baptism, and we see them get baptized in the name of Jesus. John said what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Their hearts were pricked. They knew that they were sinners, but they did not know the name of Jesus yet. That's why we've got to go out and tell people. Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And if they see you live like Christ, maybe they'll say, what must I do then to be saved? If they see you living like the devil, what's the chances? Mighty miracles were performed through Paul. Jewish leaders even cast out demons in the name of Jesus. But they did not know Jesus. So in Acts 19 verse 15, you read this. Eventually one of the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. The attack was so violent that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus. A fear came over all of them, so the name of the Lord was held in high honor. 
Paul spent time there building this church in Ephesus. This church that fell madly in love with Jesus because of what he did for them. They didn't hold on to the things of the world or th the, 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 the money or anything else. They loved Jesus. But what about that letter that Jesus writes to them later? How they've fallen away from their first love. So even if you mean it, it's a constant thing. Love, love is a constant act a constant verb that you're going to have throughout your, throughout your life. And will you love in spite of the way that you're treated? Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Maybe sometimes the things that happen, like Paul and Silas, are to build our character more. I don't know. All I know is that I am supposed to love because I know God's love for me. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So how can I be not compelled to show a life of love when I have received salvation, been pardoned, and become a child of God and everything else? How can I not show love? Acts 20, when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for his disciples after encouraging them. He said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia, and the church was there in Ephesus and continued on till we learn more about it in Revelation. Acts chapter 20, verses 10 and 11. But Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and embraced him. Do not be alarmed, he said. He is still alive. Then Paul went back upstairs, broke bread, and ate. And after speaking until daybreak, he departed. I didn't tell you what that was about first. That was about this long-winded preacher <laughs> that, that talked about Jesus so long, and everybody was so excited about it. It didn't matter how late it was. And he fell asleep out of the third-story window and fell down dead. What does Paul do? He just goes over and says, get up, and they go back to preaching. <laughs> what if I did that? Would that be okay? Do you love the Lord enough to commit your time, every bit of it that you have, for every single day that you have? Because if you love like Him in the world, there will be people that will be saved, and hopefully it will be your family, your friends, your children, your grandchildren, even your enemies. Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did did for you fast forward to that letter in Revelation to the angel of the church in Ephesus write Revelation 2 verse 1 these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands I know your deeds your labor your perseverance I know that you cannot tolerate those who are evil and you have tested and exposed as liars those who falsely claim to be apostles Without growing weary, you have persevered and endured many things for the sake of my name. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. Repent and perform the deeds you did at first. But if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this to your credit. You hate the work of the Nicolosians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes... I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. I asked you before in Scripture, who is it that overcomes? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb in our testimony, the love that we have that we show because we don't just profess to love, but we show it. Now, examine this briefly. Jesus said, I know your deeds. That meant they were good. I know your labor the things that you've done. I know your perseverance, so you've continued on. This marriage has lasted this long, however many years it is. I know that you can't tolerate those who are evil. You hate sin. You have tested and exposed liars, these false preachers that have come in, and the claims and the doctrines that they make. You have not grown weary. You persevered and endured many things, persecution, beating by rods and whips potentially. You've done that for my namesake. That's a lot, guys. A lot more than most of us will ever go through. But I have this against you. You don't love me as much as you used to. Wow. I've done all these things. My works testify to you that I love you. All the things that I said, you've shown a life that says I love you. But Jesus knows your heart. He knows when you say I love you. When we sang those choruses, 
He knows if you're sincere about it, regardless of your actions, your circumstances, anything else. So that whenever something happens to you like Paul and Silas, there's nothing that's going to come out of your mouth or out of, uh, uh, out of your being other than I will praise you, Lord, because you made me, you redeemed me, and I am forever yours, and I need to be a light in this world regardless. So I'm going to love. Turn back to your first love. Therefore, keep in mind how far you've fallen. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you have. Like I said, if you're not constantly, daily, spending so much time with the one that you love, understanding how much they love you and loving them back in return, then you've probably fallen some from the day you realized how much God loved you or you have not ever really realized how much God loved you. You need to turn to Him for salvation or you need to turn back because your love is not as strong as it used to be. Repent and perform the deeds you did at first. What? You just told me all these things that I did. Yeah, but did I do them because I've been married for 30 years, so I will open the door for you to get in the car? Or did I do it because I want to open the door for my princess because she's my everything? The deed's still there, but where's my heart? When I open the door for Sherry, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Where is your heart? Keep in mind how far you've fallen and do something about it. Because Jesus loves you. I'm going to close with this. This is just some thoughts. You may agree with some of them. You may not. I read this and I modified it some. But this was an article about American Christianity versus New Testament Christianity. In American Christianity, there's no fear of God in Christians. You do what you want. Even in worship service, it's all about me or the programs, not about God. Worship is performance-driven, not heart-driven. God will be impressed with how well we sing the song. Prayer then was every day, not a prayer meeting or a certain time in, in the service or <laughs> when you need Him. Evangelism was done outside the church. Now you're told to bring them in for a head count. Giving is how much I have to give versus not trusting God with my money unless it's a building project. The apostles had no gold, lots of glory. Today we have lots of gold and no glory. That's a quote from L Leonard Ravenhill. Churches boast of the work they do rather than let God, God reward them in heaven doing their deeds silently. No peon can correct or rebuke a leader. If you don't agree fully, just find another church. Programs have replaced the Holy Spirit. If we need more people, let's have more programs. Pastors tend to preach politics and what is acceptable rather than holiness and love. Believers were separated. They lived counter-culturally. Now can you tell the difference between them and the world? Tithing is more blessed than obedience. Forgiveness is more acceptable than holiness. Good things, but with the wrong motives again. Cherry-picking scriptures. Better choose the one you like and avoid the ones that go against your flesh. You pass a class to be a member instead of calling on Jesus' name. I like that one. The modern American church is a lot of glitter and no power. The New Testament church was all power and no glitter. I wonder what letter Jesus would write to the American church. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you for the fact that I know that you love me. And I know that love is for everyone. I know that it is for the good, the bad. Your scriptures tell me, your word tells me that you sun, send sunshine and rain to everyone. Why in the world would I want to judge or think that I'm better than or anything else? It's only by grace, by your mercy and grace that you poured out your love when Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross and gave his life up for me. 
accursed by dying on a tree, mocked and belittled and, and beaten to where he didn't even resemble a human being, all because he took your wrath out so that I could be called a child of God. Oh, Father, help me and help everyone in here that is willing to seek you, to find you, Lord, to experience you more every day of that amazing love that you have for them and empower us through your Spirit to live like Christ in this world, to get out of our easy chair, to do whatever it is and to take chances and to, and to be compelled to tell others about Jesus Christ and to do something about the injustices and the pain and the suffering in this world, Lord. Not to think of ourselves, but to think about the mission that Jesus gave us the authority and the power to, to fulfill, to proclaim the Word of God and make disciples thereof. And Lord, we pray a special prayer for our families, our children, Lord, that you've given us as a blessing and a heritage. We pray, Lord, that we guide them into all truth, Lord, that they carry on this message to generation after generation, if that's what we have. We also pray, on the other hand, that you come soon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.